So it gives me enormous uh, pleasure to introduce this final keynote for what has been a remarkable conference and there could be no better person to end the conference than Erin Griffey. Erin Griffey is a professor, associate professor of the history of art at Auckland University and she is also a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. Her PhD was from the Courtauld Institute at the University of London. She's particularly interested in visual material culture of the period and particularly in adornment and display. And amongst her many publications, uh, a very noted publication many of us admire and know is her book that was published with Yale University Press in 2016 on display, Henrietta Maria and Materials of Magnificence at the Stuart Court. Her expertise lies very much with the Stuart Court, but also she's published edited uh, volumes on the Low Countries, for instance. And in the context of this conference, I particularly want to highlight her phenomenal edited volume published by Amsterdam University Press in 2019. And uh, that was called um, Sartorial Politics at the Early Modern Court, Fashioning Women really important publication. And in fact, she's uh, edited another volume called Early Modern Court Cultures that is forthcoming this year. And uh, meanwhile, she's been collaborating uh, with chemists, I understand, uh, in her work towards a new um, uh, volume that will look at the culture of cosmetics and on, of the face, uh, remaking some recipes from the early modern period. And uh, the tentative title of that volume is Facing Decay, uh, Beauty uh, Wrinkles and anti-aging in early modern Europe. I think we all can't wait for that publication to come out. Uh, but meanwhile, we're very much looking forward to uh, your keynote today. Over to you, Erin. Well, thank you so much, Yulinka, for that very generous introduction. And thank you to you and, of course, to the organizers, Anna and Alessandro, for inviting me. I'm really honored and delighted to be here tonight, um, whether New Zealand or in the UK. As dress historians have shown, the rituals of dressing the body at the early modern court were intimate and complex. This involved the labor of an army of craftsmen to make the garments, a team of laundresses to wash them, and an entourage of chamberers to dress their noble subject. Crisp, clean white linens were worn next to the body, and layers of garments to shape the body were mustered into place, whether sleeves attached, bodices tightly laced, farthingales and bum rolls positioned. Rich silks adorned with artful embroidery, dazzling metals and tailor's flourishes like aiglettes and pinking were showcased to best visual advantage. This intimate portrait of Lady Elizabeth Ridsley shows the Countess of Southampton in this process of getting dressed. It reveals the layers of garments worn, the fastenings and ribbons to mold the body, and to the left on the table, a pin cushion teeming with well over a hundred pins to hold everything in place. You see here two jewelry laid out for positioning on top of and alongside her garments, her hair, and her skin. And of course, you see those pearls that Alessandro was talking about at the end of his talk, and we're going to return to pearls in a moment too. In another toilette scene, Gerard Tabork depicts a Dutch lady with her attendant fastening a tie. A male servant nearby carries a gilt bottle, which I suspect holds perfume. The sky blue of her bodice and pearlescent satin skirt coordinate with the cool white palette of the lady's face, flushed with a gentle rosy blush. The rich silks, glistening gold trimming of her skirt and her delicate scarf, her pearl necklace, 
gilt objects of the toilette, her complexion, they all sparkle with a luminosity that reflects variety, rarity, value, and beauty. For queens and noblewomen whose social currency rested on marriage and children, facial complexion was a powerful mirror of quality and a canvas for enhancing the natural beauty within. Moreover, for the elite, dressing was a multi-sensory event. Dressing was a visual spectacle, a tactile invitation, an audible impression, and all richly scented. The body, linens, garments, hanging pomanders, and even the rooms, they were all perfumed. The scents of roses, orange flowers, lavender, amber, and musk mingling. One might read the portrait of the Countess of Southampton as itself sweetly scented, adorned as she is with an embroidered waistcoat teeming with climbing flowers, fruits, and insects. And I've endeavored to identify them in the text on the lower right. The sweetening of bodily smells extended to the breath. And there are a number of recipes in the recipe books to give you a sweet breath. And these typically combined rosemary and white wine. The head and hair too would have been laced with a combination of natural musky oils from the hair with washes that were combed or sponged directly onto the hair. And again, rosemary features prominently um, in such sort of hair washing concoctions. Curls were spun with hot curling irons and held in place with waxy resinous lotions made of ingredients like gum Arabic. Hair dressing, as you'll see, and, and as you have seen, is the main feature of many painted toilette scenes, such as this charming Dutch one, where you see a broad assortment of vessels holding various tinctures. My starting point then is to underscore that dress then and now must be understood as a multi-sensory cultural and material practice. The term adornment captures this well as it stresses the whole range of bodily display. And yet dress history tends to focus on garments often at the expense of other essential elements of the dressed body, jewelry, and as I will discuss today, beautifying treatments to adorn the skin of the face. Given that Eileen Ribeiro had originally been scheduled to have been this conference keynote, I thought it would be appropriate for me to cast my net wide in looking at dress in these very broad terms. As many of you will know, Eileen wrote an important book, Facing Beauty, Painted Women in Cosmetic Art with Yale in 2011. One could argue that a dress historian is particularly attuned to ideals of female beauty and how they are shaped and mirrored in artworks and how, of course, they are reflected in the cosmetic adornment of the body. While cultural historians such as Katie Walter and Claudia Benthien have analogized the skin with clothing in the medieval and modern contexts, I think there is considerable scope to consider this in relation to early modern Europe and in today's context, in the context of court portraiture. For indeed, the adornment of the habit of the body necessitated more than layers of garments and jewels. It demanded the adornment of the hair and Susan North and Edith Snook have recently discussed aspects of hair and more is currently be done, being done by Victoria Munn. Bodily adornment also depended on the skin of the face and this was used to maximize its naturally radiant beauty. Notably, 
the top layer of skin was known as the scarf skin, comparing the epidermis to a thin, often silken garment. These passages from 17th century surgical texts use this term scarf skin and both locate the scarf skin as a key site of adornment of physical beauty. This scarf analogy is apt too, of course, because it suggests a garment, something applied to the face to adorn it. And I should say in this context too, that certainly um, in wardrobe accounts in the 17th century, you do find this term scarf to refer to a, a garment as well. Habit too was used to describe the skin in medical texts. And of course, habit was also used to describe um, one's whole appearance in 17th century texts in terms of uh, dress and overall bodily adornment. This 1523 Italian surgical text includes illustrations which present this top layer of skin or epidermis as a garment that is pulled back to expose the dermis. For a visual embodiment of this idea, one might, one might point to this school of Fontainebleau depiction of a woman at her toilette. Essentially for me, this is a picture about dress in its broadest sense. The adorning of the hair and face, excuse me, the adorning of the hair and skin of the face and body. In the intricately styled and bejeweled hair, her jewelry, the gossamer toilette garment, which itself sits around her shoulders, flecked with metal thread and edging, the cosmetics and the scent of the flowers in the room. And I'm looking at the flowers in the foreground and in the vase in the background. And there appear to be, again, very fragrant flowers that are being depicted here. Roses, orange blossoms, and I think a little dianthus, which is what we call a pink. And these were flowers that were all known for their really rich smell. Given this shared language of adornment to describe dressing the body with clothes and beautifying the face with cosmetics, my talk today considers the dressing of the female face in early modern Europe. In the early modern period, women, and in particular the face, were singled out as exemplifying beauty. This dress of the face is, I quote, beauty's silken livery, as the 17th century English author, Thomas Jameson, terms beauty. This is beauty that has a natural softness and shine like silk. But it, it is also a livery, a garment that is recognizable to the wider community as beautiful. As such, the dressed face signifies participation in a community of the beautiful through the telltale signs of beauty. Above all, as I will show today, good color and shine. This is akin to the finest silks worn on the bodies of beautiful women so adorned as the previous toilette images show. My work is of course indebted to Eileen Ribeiro and other historians of dress, but I'm also looking to historians of science and medicine. Given the conference focus on the court portrait, my analysis considers how such works dress the face with the palette of beauty, white and red, and made beautifully luminous with highlights and varnish. The paper is divided into three sections. First, I will introduce the language of adornment, pointing to the shared language in the early modern period of adorning the body with both dress and cosmetics. The next section focuses on color 
as an, an essential shared feature of sartorial and cosmetic adornment. Finally, I, can text, I consider texture and shine. As I will argue, the dressing of the face, the scarf skin of the epidermis, was as carefully managed as garments on the body in real life and in court portraits. Many early modern writers connected the adornment of the body in clothing with the covering of the skin, especially the face, but also the hands with cosmetics. The frontispiece of Thomas Tuke's 1616 Discourse Against Painting and Tincturing Women shows on the frontispiece a richly dressed female subject. Her full length portrayal demonstrates that instead of concentrating solely on the face of his subject, Tuke sees fit to detail her whole body. This full body focus helps to characterize the subject in terms of her, her preoccupation with adornment. And this also connects clothing with cosmetics. The female subjects quote, pride and ambition as Tuke states on the title page is evident in her face painting, but also in her enormous farthingale, tightly laced bodice, heavily pinked skirt, and coif topped jauntily with a feather. The cross hatching in her face also points to the tincturing there. This heavily moralizing book characterizes this ostentatious artificial woman as obsessed with both clothes and cosmetics as the passages cited here evidence this woman depends on her powder and her clothes, both her apparel and her face are key to her adornment. For Tuke, these adornments are commodities bought above all in London. London, London, London hath her heart. The exchange is the temple of her idols. In London, she buys her head her face, her fashion. O oh, London, thou art her paradise, her heaven, her all in all. The passage cited here below that points to the artificers who accomplish this false beauty. The tailor, the chambermaid, and her own skill as an artificer of her face. He claims that her Fair shows are like a piece of coarse cloth with a fine glass. As critical as Tug is, we can see that he is also giving women real agency here as artists. Similarly, the English preacher Thomas Taylor in his moralizing homily, a glass for gentlewomen to dress themselves, conceives of dress in a very broad sense of attire and ornament, and thus encompasses clothing, hair, and cosmetics. George Glover's depiction of the sense of sight finds its perfect embodiment in the figure of a lady at her toilette, admiring herself in the mirror. What she admires is her whole habit including her clothing, jewelry, face, and freshly combed and curled hair. With her blooming waistcoat on show, her slender fingers drawing attention to her pearl necklace and her clear unblemished skin, she is worthy to be viewed by others. The expectation that fashionable appearance was dictated not solely by clothes, but by cosmetics and hair is found too in Mary Evelyn's Ladies' Dressing Room Unlocked from 1690. 
This is a satire on the fashionable excesses of the time. The conceit is that a young amorous fop is journeying to marry land or marriage and outlines what he needs to equip his new and it seems a rather demanding new wife. These necessities include a treasure trove of fashionable clothes, gowns, waistcoats, smocks, shoes, garters, scented fans, fur muffs, rings, necklaces, bodkins for the hair, scented gloves, and cosmetics. This, lust, this list runs in a breathless profusion from ruffles and ribbons and gloves seamlessly into perfume and cosmetics. The dressing room is moreover, not solely focused on dressing the body with rich layers of garments, ribbons and jewels, but also on dressing the hair with combing and curling and on dressing the face and hands to make them plump, soft and white and to color the lips. And I can speak about the lip color later if you'd like me to, because it's relatively um, complex. These are all part of the same world of ladies adornment. As this passage details, these garments and beauty treatments were all richly scented. The linens, the gloves, the fans, pomanders, the dressing room itself. And of course, too, the um, cosmetics used on the hair and on the face are themselves very, very richly scented. So the dressing room and dressed body of the early modern elite woman were sensorially intoxicating. The textures, colors, and smells would have all competed with each other for richness. Mary Evelyn's satirical description of a lady's dressing room is followed in the same volume by another text, her so-called FOP dictionary. This comprises all of the sartorial and cosmetic features of adornment seen here, including terms associated with cosmetic, hair, garments, trimming, and jewelry. As with the dressing room unlocked, these were all essential features of the adornment of the body. Moreover, to early modern women, especially those at court, dressing was conceived in a broad sense of overall bodily adornment. Color was a defining feature of this adornment, whether color in clothing, jewelry and fine metals, hair color or cosmetics. The palette of beauty was red and white. This was typically analogized as a rose and lily complexion. And again, of course, this conjures up smell this palette of beauty is suitably embodied here in Van Dyck's portrait of the rose and lily queen herself, the French, the French born Bourbon princess, Henrietta Maria, whose marriage to the English King Charles I was described as the joining of the lily, France and the rose, England. These floral ingredients were also frequently used in beautifying recipes. And so white lily roots were a very common ingredient in recipes to whiten and smooth the skin. And uh, roses were often used to cool a hot skin. White skin, rosy cheeks, and luminous texture were beautiful precisely because they were seen to be indexes of inner health. Good color then of the face was ideally not the result of face covering paint, but the outcome of balanced humors, 
good inner health. So the ideal was that your blood was naturally coursing um, to the top of your skin and that that was the blush that was coming from your healthy blood. Rebalancing and maintaining this health necessitated um, balancing your humors with the topical application of cosmetics. And these range from waters and liniments and ointments, oils, but as well as ingested medicines, um, often purgatives, and also a very carefully calibrated diet. All of these might help you to achieve good color without the application of pigment. Thus, the key point here is that the goal was natural color, or at least very natural looking. And people could be highly critical of women that they thought were overly done up. And I think, again, this is this criticism that they had painted it, painted it on, and therefore their color wasn't good because it wasn't natural. But of course, today we're dealing with court portraits. Painters have to use pigments to represent this palette of beauty. And recipes themselves indicate that women did seem to use pigments sometimes for this to produce good color, but they also used in the main clear formulas to maintain their good color. Early modern recipes offered a variety of treatments to color the skin. Um, and some of the um, things recommended to produce good color were manual exfoliation of the face to, to bring um, blood um, to the surface, to impart readiness. Um, also these clear formulas, which I'll talk about a bit in a minute, but also applying extracts um, from sandalwood and Brazil wood and um, other ingredients that I've listed here. Notably, the same ingredients were used for dyeing cloth and hair as are used to color the face. And um, this is evident in a number of recipes. It is of interest too that the mordants used in dyeing cloth are also regularly found in cosmetic recipes. And this is particularly evident in hair dye. William Salmon's Polygraphies includes a section on colors to paint the face to impart whiteness and redness. The titles of the recipes typically state for good color, to make the face white or to make the face red. These red formulas typically contain Brazil wood and sandalwood, which the Portuguese began importing in the 16th century from Brazil and Southeast Asia, respectively. Salmon's recipes for red pigments extend beyond sandalwood and Brazil wood to cochineal, which again was another new world import and widely used in dress, but also crab claws Whitening, he shows, is effective through the use of lemon juice and animal bile. The Swiss physician Felix Platter's medical treatise also discusses the use of dye stuffs and dyed fabric and animal skin that were used to paint the face red so what I'm saying here is that he's saying you can apply um, these ingredients directly to your face or you know, powdered and mixed up with wax or honey or some other occlusive agent applying it to your face. Or you can take a fabric that's already dyed red or an animal skin that's already dyed red and you can wet it a little bit and use that to color your face. He recommends madder, sandalwood, Brazilwood, cochineal, and mulberries. And he points to the dual use of these ingredients for both artworks and for faces. Similarly, Johann Becker here um, in his Book of Secrets underscores the dual usage of pigments for dyeing fabrics and skin. 
And I'm showing you an excerpt from a recipe to color the skin, which calls for 25 hard boiled eggs, fig milk, alum, dyer's grain, and berries with which silk is dyed, mulberries. So what I'm saying here is that there's clearly a community of ingredients that is shared, um, whether you're dyeing silks or your skin. Nevertheless, there was, and as Tuke's um, diatribe against painting evidences, there was still anxiety about unnatural skin coloring. And this involved the direct application of reddening pigments, which they called paints. Salmon, in fact, provides a whole section of beauties, of recipes to beautify, quote, without anything of paint. So you can see here um, that the ingredients used were largely transparent formulas made of plants and animal fats. And these would have tightened the skin, made, made the skin shine using ingredients such as lemons, eggs, and sweet almond oil. The dissolving of pearls in lemon juice aimed to mimic the glistening of pearls on the skin. And um, so pearls are a reasonably common ingredient to use in beautifying um, cosmetics. And lemons are very high in citric acid. And this would have pr produced actually a pretty, a slightly caustic exfoliation um, to the skin, which is why it's not very widely used in cosmetics today. Lemons were also very common ingredients in stain removal and whitening recipes for linens. Moreover, whitening cosmetics have comparable ingredients with those suggested for stain removal, including alum, lemon juice, and white wine vinegar. So again, I'm pointing to this community of ingredients for whitening. The color of garments seems to have been a way to enhance ideal skin coloring. And in life, um, one assumes, but certainly in court portraits. The medieval surgeon Henri de Montville recognized how colors were selected strategically to coordinate with complexion. And in the sources I found, medieval and early modern, they're typically talking about women coordinating the colors of their garments um, to maximize the luminescence and good color of their skin. For a queen like Henrietta Maria, the stakes were high. Her court portraits needed to showcase a balanced complexion that combined the whiteness of lilies and the blush of roses. So what I'm arguing here is that her clothing is used strategically to maximize this. And we're back again at Van Dyck's 1632 portrait. The ideal white and red palette appears in her complexion, but also in her white satin dress accented with prominent rose hued laces and trimmings her hair adorned with a rose ribbon, ribbon covered with pearls, and she positions her pearlescent hand right above two roses. But how does this relate to the garments the queen wore in real life? Her surviving wardrobe accounts from the mid 1620s through the end of the 1630s shows that she wore a vast range of colors. And in the accounts, I have counted 45 different hues. In the accounts, black is the most common color. And yet Van Dyck only painted one portrait of her wearing black. Other common colors in the accounts include white and shades of pink, blue, and green. And thus, the white bodice and skirt combination in Van Dyck's portrait is actually consistent with the accounts, as well as the profusion of embroidery and ribbon trimmings in the portrait. However, the Queen's accounts also include a very wide range of hues that are subtle 
and others that are dark, what the English described as sad. These sad hues, such as ash, olive, straw, Isabel, and deer, would not have popped alongside her skin in court portraits. Thus, in most portraits, she has been strategically depicted in bright whites and rich jewel tones to attract the eye and complement her lily and roses complexion. Van Dyck's use of artificial color to promote the queen's complexion is apparent in this full length portrait in the Hermitage. Here, she is wearing red, possibly crimson, and yet shades of red are actually virtually unheard of in her wardrobe accounts. As such, this ensemble does not seem to be representative of any of her real life sartorial choices. And yet the whole portrait is bathed in red, her dress, the table covering, the curtain, but her fair lily and rose complexion radiates out like a beacon in this sea of red. The choice of color in her dress then may well have been strategically selected to showcase the queen's quality of birth and marriage because crimson was such an expensive dye stuff. But it also succeeds in coalescing the beauty of her lilies and roses complexion in a dramatic way. According to early modern writers, a good complexion needed not only good color, the lilies and roses of white and red, it also needed to be smooth and to be quote, shiny like a mirror. Recipes certainly catered to the demand for smooth, shiny skin. Creating smooth skin texture necessitated polishing, exfoliating ingredients and treatments to ensure the skin was uniform, soft, and pliable to the touch. Ingredients including pearls, shells, metals, talc, crystal, and even powdered glass were used in cosmetics to create sparkle. The mirror-like shine so clearly desirable in recipes finds its counterpart in depictions of ladies before a mirror being adorned and seeing their beautiful shiny reflections in a mirror. This crystalline quality is vividly described in the promise of a recipe that will make the face quote, lustrous and beautiful like a mirror. Other recipes liken the shiny quality of the skin after application of cosmetics to pearls, silver and gold imparting the face with the sparkle and inherent quality of jewels and precious metals. Pearls were more than a beauty ingredient, of course. They are ubiquitous in court portraits of women and Alessandro talk, um, was talking about that. With their placement adjacent to the face as earrings and at the neck and on bare wrists, pearls were ideal for offsetting alabaster skin to enhance its color and its luster. Shine was more than surface sparkle. It also depended on deeply moisturized skin. This was facilitated by the pervasive use of humectic ingredients that attracted moisture to the skin like honey and occlusive agents that maintain the skin's moisture levels, such as wax and stearic acid in animal fats, as well as plant oils like sesame oil. And I'm just giving you two passages here um, from Felix Flatter's um, book of recipes. And um, I like the quote on the left, you know, um, some add fat things, okay, fat things, and they um, refer to things, oils and animal milks. 
As these ingredients indicate, the vast majority of ingredients for smoothing and imparting shine to the skin were transparent. The English medical empiric salmon analogizes such formulas with the clear surface shine of varnish on a painting. He claims that the formula provides, quote, the licking over of an old withered, wrinkled, and weather-beaten skin. In this sense, we can read the varnish on a court portrait as a layer of adornment in itself, which mirrors the surface shine desired by women at court in real life. If the face was an important source of radiance in court portraits, such shine is of course comparable with the luminous texture of opulent silks of dress in the jewels sewn into them and worn alongside them. So let's consider this court portrait in this respect. Rubens's resplendent depiction of the Marchesa Brigida Spinola Doria. Her luster is conveyed and let's linger on every feature of this luster in her skin, her eyes, hair, jewelry and dress. Rubens renders this through the dexterous use of highlights. Sparkling passages of white lead are found on the forehead, the chin, just above the lip, the corners of the eye. Pops of white dot the pearls of her earring and headdress. And the artist also meticulously threads wiry strokes through her hair. He bristles white highlights into her spectacular ruff and cuffs. These highlights are deployed not only to carve out space, but to dapple it with sparkle. In addition, the deep insistent brushstrokes on her white satin bodice, sleeves, skirt, and overgown all draw attention to the physicality of the body underneath as well as the weight and sheen of the fabric. Finally, sparkle is delivered in the golden materials, the gold metal fashioned into the headdress, sewn into the sleeves, woven into the fan, molded into buttons, pendants, in that spectacular massive wrapped chain. This luminosity combines with the lily and rose's complexion of her soft skin, the white and red hues of her dress and drapery, which all illustrate the Marchesa as a paradigm of ideal court beauty. The cultivation of this superficial sparkle on the skin was widely promoted to women at court. In descriptions too, shine was presented as an index of quality, of nobility. George Hartman's recipe collection, for example, is dedicated to Anne, Countess of Sunderland. In consideration of all your shining virtues and excellencies, whose luster was so bright, from the splendor you derive from the noble ancient family you sprung of, you, your illustrious stem. For Hartman, as for other writers, luster was a sign of beauty precisely because it was associated with good health and noble blood. This makes shine the prerogative of women at court and essential features of their portraits. Peter Lilly here commemorates the Countess's starry beauty in this portrait, a swathe of smooth alabaster skin juxtaposed with warm metal-hued garments, light blonde curls, her face set forth alongside a rich round golden vessel. The cosmetics um, in the recipes are often also authorized by queens and ladies, created for them 
and used by them. One of the recipes inside Hartman's book is attributed to the Stuart courtier, courtier Sir Kenham Digby. It promises to smooth, whiten, and beautify the complexion of ladies. As such, portraits like Lily's of Lady Sunderland necessitated the adornment of their noble subject with shiny jewels, garments, and skin. I've not had time to consider hands too as a site of beauty and key element in court portraits. In the rendering of their smooth, plump, white skin, but also their del delicate, balletic gestures. Recipes tailored specifically to hands are very common in recipe books. The smoothing cosmetic treatments can be interpreted as transparent garments. The gloves worn to protect and dress their hands were expected to be richly scented and were also lined with occlusive ingredients to moisturize and plump. Like the skin of the face, these taut second skins, typically made of animal skins, thus performed both a sartorial and a cosmetic function. To conclude, Dressing the early modern court portrait involved the adornment of the body as a whole with garments, jewels, cosmetics, hairstyling, and scent. All of these elements were essential for dressing a court lady. For subjects of portraits, garments needed to be carefully selected in their cut, color, and embellishment. But so too did their skin need to be cultivated to showcase their beauty. For artists, a portrait involved situating and posing the subject, and it involved applying color with careful attention to shades of white and red in the flesh and often in the garments. Like the portrait's other facets, color was executed strategically as gentle blended passages to illustrate smooth skin, as the dappled highlights of jewels, hair and luminous flesh, or as the electrifying strokes that mimic the bristle of activated silks in motion, like we saw in the portrait by Rubens. Varnish on top provided that licked shiny top coat. And for their noble subjects, this dressing of the body was the centerpiece of their social and cultural lives in terms of time, effort, expense, pleasure, and reputation. For adornments were not only synonymous with, but created beauty. These adornments cultivated and reflected trends in beauty at court and were the measurement of a courtly woman's quality. They needed to be paraded and communicated in portraits, portraits which crystallize their subjects typically in the bloom of youth. Juxtaposed with garments, yet very much part of the sitter's dressed reputation, the skin was beauty's silken livery, smooth and lustrous, capturing light and life attired in beauty's official colors of red and white. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for an illuminating keynote that showed that uh, we have to think about dressing the portrait in conjunction with dressing the skin. That was also a point brought out by Anna Howie's paper very powerfully yesterday, just for those who are catching up on uh, this conference later. But thank you very, very much for, for this keynote. And over to Anna and Alessandro for some concluding remarks, but not uh, without, from my part, also congratulations congratulating Alessandra and Anna on a fantastic conference and a great contribution to dress history through it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Olinka. And again, Erin, thank you for such a wonderful, uh, rich talk. I know I was avidly taking notes, um, such an interesting take that perfectly tied into all the themes that we've been exploring over the past two days, so thank you. Um, and with that, uh, we're now at the end of dressing a picture um, of our second day, and it has been an absolute pleasure to see so many of you um, engaging and participating with our speakers. And I think this really clearly demonstrates that this field holds still considerable research potential. Um, and I'm sure we'll all go away and keep you know, working hard on, on our uh, various projects. Um, we'd like to thank again our funding bodies, CRASH, uh, the School of the Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Cambridge and the Royal Historical Society. And with that, thank you again uh, and a good night or a good day wherever in the world you happen to be. Thank you.